Okay, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you to the organizers of this nice conference. And it's so nice to see so many people that I already know. It's so great to see all of you here. Uh, so in this talk I will uh, tell you about one piece of uh, Haskell and one piece of type theory, a very small one. So uh, it's, it's not something big, something crucial, but it's something that I like very much about Haskell and type theory. And I want to tell you that there is no difference between Haskell and type theory. It's actually the same thing. So theory is working for good in Haskell, and that's not the case in other programming languages. So at this slide, you can see several quotes about theory and practice. If you read those quotes, I'm not going to read them out loud, so you can read, it, uh, read them by yourself. So all those guys, they are very practical. And it looks like they don't like theory. So they, they think, well, theory is just fine, but when you do something, it's totally different. And of course, you can use something from that theory, but then still you have your own problems, and it's something totally different. And in Haskell, so if, if you are done with this, we'll, we'll go further. In Haskell, it's, it's not a problem, and it's it, it was never a problem. It's all the same. Like, for example, this is type inference rule for functions. I will talk a little bit more about it later. And this is how they do this in Glasgow Haskell compiler. So it's a, it's a function. Well, you don't have to read all this code. So it's TC. TC means type checker. Fun app means function application. So this is how they translate this to this. So that's, you see that it's, it's the same thing, actually. So you can, you can read, it, read it and understand very quickly. So, so theory and practice. So that's what I'm going to talk about here. Uh, in 1930s, when it was all started, uh, there was a guy, Alonso George, who, was, uh, who worked in Princeton University. It's a very nice small town there, and it was nice to do some science there. Uh, so he invented, or some people say discovered, lambda calculus there. So it, it, it was like 1932, 1933. Nowadays, it's very difficult to pick the, the, the one single point in time when it, it happened. So uh, I'm presenting here this lambda calculus using uh, quite modern notation. George uh, didn't use it, but nowadays it's, it's very uh, convenient, and I'm using this uh, Types and Programming Languages book by Pierce. Just right now, it's classical ABC book for type theory, and everyone can read it. It's very nice. So what is Lambda Calculus that was discovered by George in, in 1930s? It's actually some syntax first, and this is the, the definition, and this uh, definition says that Every lambda term is either variable, which is denoted here by x, but of course it can be any, any uh, letter here, uh, or abstraction, and this is just syntax, and letter lambda here is, is just nothing special. It could be any other letter, so it just turns out to be lambda. Some people says, say that it's... Uh, Lambda because of uh, an error which was made when uh, the paper was typeset, like it was X with some uh, symbol over it, and then it turns out to be lambda as an error. So it doesn't matter actually. So, uh, so abstraction and application, and there is no other sense behind these letters. People always try to think well. I think that this is variable like variable in programming or like variable in mathematics. Someone tends to think that abstraction is a function. Well, you don't have to think about that. So it's just some syntactical feature. So, uh, and then there is also application, or we call it juxtaposition. So when two things are standing right close to each other. So again, no other sense behind the syntax here. So just, just syntax, just lambda terms. And then, as usual with this notation, 
you can use this uh, definition many times to build something bigger. And then there is one more notion here, notion of a value. And you see the value can be like this. So this abstraction can be a value, and there are no other values here. So that's syntax of lambda calculus. And just to give you an example, this is an example of lambda term. So please think, how many times uh, do you have to apply definition of a lambda term to build something like this? So how many times you have to apply those, that definition? So, so this term is a application, because it's two things together. This first thing, second thing. Uh, this thing is uh, abstraction, so it's second time. Then abstraction was built with this body, and it's uh, application again, so it's third time. And every x, every occurrence of x is just one part of one application of that definition, so it's four and five. And this one is uh, lambda abstraction, so it's six. And I think this, this one is the last one, so it's seven. So you have to uh, use that definition seven times to build something like this. So this is an example of a lambda term built from, from scratch. Uh, but, and you see that this lambda term is not a value, because value is just abstraction, and this is application, so it's not a value. Uh, all right, uh, so originally Church invented all this stuff for doing logic, for thinking about logic, for uh, he tried to prove something about logic, and he failed. It turns out that this system doesn't work. So, but, but then he realized that it is possible to describe computation using this thing. So that we can do something, we can compute those lambda terms to get something new. And these are rules for computation. In type theory, they call this uh, evaluation, or sometimes they say dynamics, or sometimes they say operational semantics. Uh, technically, it's a relation which takes one term and transforms it to another term. So this is, you see this in, in this rectangle, it's uh, the, the form of that relation. So in type theory, they use relations when something relates to something, and they use different symbols uh, to uh, denote that. So like here, they use this arrow to say, transforming this to this. And these are rules for this uh, evaluation, for this relation. And technically, these rules are very algorithmic. So if you're not used to this, you, 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 you usually read this, them uh, like this. So you want to do something, you want to build relation here in the bottom part. And in order to get that relation, you have to get something like this first. So if you have something above the line, then you can do something under that line. So that's an idea. So if you can go from T1 to T1 prime, then you can go from this application to this application. And if you look closely at these three rules, you may figure out how to do that properly. So, uh, so here you see that at the first time, you have to compute left part of the application. So you see, if you can uh, compute left part, to something different using this, then you can go from this term to this term. Then, if you have a value on the left-hand side of an application, here is value, letter V, then you can do the same thing with the right part of the application. So first you compute left part, then when it's a value, you finish computing, then you compute the right part, and then, finally, you can come to something like this, when you have an application with a value with lambda abstraction on the left-hand side, and then you have some value on the right-hand side, and only after that you can do this. So this is a reduction. It's a main relation lambda calculus. So you reduce left part, we call it redox, to something like this. This is a substitution, and basically you just take this uh, x and replace it with this value. 
uh, in every occurrence. So that's it. So let's, let's look at a simple example how we can apply uh, all this stuff. So uh, this is our lambda term, which uh, I showed you before. So we have three rules. And the first thing we have to see what rule can be applied in this situation. Uh, and we have definitely we have an application. And in the left hand side of that application, we have a lambda abstraction, and that's a value. And then this is abstraction again, so that's a value too. And that means that the only rule that can be applied here, let's let's go back, is this one. So you have lambda abstraction here and you have any value here. So in this case, you can apply it. And if we apply it, so it's just substitution, so we, uh, we are using this. So I am replacing x with right-hand side in the body of this lambda abstraction. And that's it. So pretty, pretty technical thing. But when, when you look here at your result, you may realize that it's again a... Uh, you can do reduction again, so because it, it's also application with an abstraction on the left-hand side. So we apply the same rule again, and the result will be this one. And now it's a value, and you can do nothing about it. So that's the result of your computation. So uh, here we can use lambda calculus for doing computation, but... Um, and now, after we introduce that, we can think about lambda abstractions as a functions, and we can think about applications as a real application function to some argument. But it's an a informal, informal notion of all this stuff. So we just try to describe computation using this uh, formalism. So, of course, uh, when you want to do something real, you need a little bit more than that. So you need some data structures, you may need natural numbers or something from uh, some Boolean values, something like that. And when you want something like that, you have two options. And it's always uh, the case that you have these options. And George had them, so it was possible to encode all these ideas using lambda calculus. Or you can introduce new, as, as we say it nowadays, we can introduce new language features. Uh, remember that uh, at that time, there were no programming languages. Like, first programming language was created, if I'm not mistaken, like in, in the beginning of 40s in, 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 in Germany. So uh, it's a it's, uh, very old time there. But anyway, so we can encode everything, or we can introduce new language feature. George started with the first option, uh, and he was able to encode all natural numbers, all operations, and some operations were very difficult to encode, some were easy. Like, for example, sub subtraction was very difficult. It took several months to figure out how to do something minus one, and it was very, very difficult story. Uh, so nowadays, like if you're programming in Scala, then you always introduce new language feature, like every feature per hour, something like that. Uh, so that's, that's what they do. But of course, all these options, you can do them all the time. But then it turns out that uh, there are something strange things in that lambda calculus. So you can encode something very unnatural using those computations. So the next idea was to introduce types to set some borders, to, to turn lambda calculus computations into something more meaningful. So George wanted to remove all strange cases that were possible with lambda calculus. So he introduced types, so he, want, he wanted this type discipline. And extension was uh, very simple. And you see that here, the solution was to introduce new language features. So types were not encoded using lambda calculus. They were just introduced in addition to that. And extension was very moderate, so it was just, we just introduced this syntax for types. And originally, the simplest type was uh, this. It's an arrow type, type for functions. And 
And then we introduced a set of bindings. So this context is just a set of binding uh, variables. So we just say, this variable is of this type. If you think about this definition, you may come up with an idea that it's impossible to build anything, anything with that. Well, there, of course, well, it, it's impossible to come up with the simplest type here. Do you see that? So if you have it some type, then you can build a function. But how would you come up with the first type to build a function? But that, that was not a problem, so you can introduce some, contact, uh, some constant types, like naturals or booleans or something uh, like that. But uh, in the pure lambda calculus or simply typed lambda calculus, there were no anything like that, so just no terms at all, and it was just fine. Uh, and then uh, the idea was to add this type information to the variables in abstractions. So that's the only addition to the lambda term. So I'm using these gray boxes for uh, showing something new. So we had lambda calculus and we've defined it already. And then this, uh, in gray box, you have an addition, extension to that. And then, of course, you have to change values because you, have, you need to have this type information there. So, if you have types, then you have to check them. And all evaluation rules are just the same. You don't have to change them because, well, it's uh, evaluation uh, works independently of types. But then you have to check types somehow. And these are typing rules. So, uh, if you first time see typing rule, it may be a little bit difficult to get what is it all about. So, in fact, very simple algorithms are actually behind that. So if you talk to a type theorist and he or she showed you this uh, typing rule, you immediately realize what to do. And it's very easy, actually. Or maybe not that easy, but uh, there will be talk here today that, that Christophe will tell you that it's not that easy to follow these typing rules, but for type theorists, it's very easy. So you just uh, immediately know what to do. For example, if you want to check or infer a type for this application, you have to check that left-hand side is a function and right-hand side is an argument of the type that you need. So an argument of that function, and that's it. So, uh, you, and you control everything. And if you have this and you have this, then you can immediately judge something like this. So, uh, application has this type. Uh, and this is the type which introduced uh, lambda abstractions. And now we can see that lambda abstractions, they are really functions. So, they have these arrow types. Uh, and this is a very simple rule for typing variables. It's the only one way to type variables is to have them in a context. If you have this information about variable in a context, then you can come up with a type of that variable. So this is trivial rule. And these two, they are not that trivial, but uh, uh, we can use them in theory. So in this example, you can see that we can build uh, huge trees with all those rules. And it's uh, actually the algorithm which is encoded in this, this notation using these trees. And technically, there are two algorithms there. So one is type checking, is when you have this information, that you, you know that this term has type bool, and you want to check that it's really the case, that it has this type. And another algorithm is when you don't know the type, but you want to infer this type. You have this term and you want to get the uh, type of it. But all these type checking and type inference, they were all they are all described using this notation of uh, these, these trees with type, uh, typing rules. Okay, so uh, we can also do something, we can erase types. I'm not sure, I think in Java they keep types forever in there, if, if I'm not mistaken. So they, they don't erase them, so they have, or maybe, maybe I'm, I'm just, maybe in C-sharp. So somewhere they do have types when they evaluate things, so they, uh, that, that's for sure. So we don't have to do that in type theory, we can just erase them. So you see that when you're talking about type theory, you have all this information, you, you can actually uh, 
you think about practical things. So there is a little bit of pragmatics there. So you think about how to compute all this stuff if you have real hardware. And of course, we didn't have in that time. In the 40s, there were no hardware for doing that stuff, but they were thinking about it. Uh, there was uh, a problem, one problem with simply type lambda calculus. So if you want to do something like this, so double application, then you have to specify types uh, very clearly. So you see that these three programs, they are the same. So I'm showing them in blue. So the same programs, but they still, uh, you have to repeat all that information. So when you compute it, the same program, when you type a different program, so you want to do something about that, and it is possible, actually, you can introduce so-called system F. It's an extension of lambda calculus. It was invented twice by a uh, guy from Logic, Girard, and a guy from computer science, Reynolds. Uh, so, and thus, we have these different names for that. So they introduced a new type here with for all quantifier, and new big lambda for types. And the idea was, well, we can replace those types with something like one variable, and then we can use type application for that. So now it will be ID function, identity function for natural type. And we can do the same thing with doubles. So just for any variable X, type variable X, we say it here, the type is as, as follows. So I'm not going to details here, but the idea is to, so system F is very practical. You don't want to specify types, different types for the same computation. So you just come up with this new idea of doing it polymorphically. Uh, uh, and this is, again, an extension, very small extension. You just introduce type variables, you introduce this new type, uh, you change context a little bit, and then some, uh, big lambda for types, and then type application, and now you have two lambdas, you have big lambda, small lambda, you have two applications for terms and for, for types, uh, and that's what, what they have in system F. So now you can use all this stuff. And of course you have many typing rules, and uh, I'm not going, uh, not going in details here, but uh, any typing rule, if you look uh, long enough at it, you just, uh, realize what is going on there. And even more, so some people introduce system F omega here. Uh, it's an idea for doing computations over types. So now you can create much more sophisticated types like pairs, like lists of something. So you can do uh, anything like that. Okay, and uh, if you have all those systems, like we had three of them, uh, it's, very it's very easy to get lost. And in 1991 or 1992, I think Henk Barendrecht, it's a scientist from Netherlands, he invented or imagined lambda cube. The lambda cube, you, can, you may think about it like a periodic table in chemistry. It's some system which uh, says, the, which gives the place to every type system. So we were talking about simply type lambda calculus here, uh, and I, I was talking about polymorphic lambda calculus here, and I was talking about this lambda omega system here, so I was giving you examples of these three. And the idea of this cube is as follows. So what, what do you do, actually? You extend simply lambda calculus with three sorts of dependencies. This way was when value depends on time, on type. So what is polymorphism? So depending on the actual type, you may have different values. So values depend on type. So this one is types depend on type. So these are type functions. And this arrow is uh, types depends on values. So these are so-called dependent types that are coming here. Like right now, in Haskell, what they do, there is a process of moving to this part, so to this corner of lamb uh, to the lambda cube. So when they finally implement dependent types in Haskell, it will be like here. But you may think that Haskell, as we 
know it, as you may know it, is a little bit different of what I said before. Uh, well, in fact, it's not. So this is uh, a real quote from Glasgow Haskell compiler, and I just specified the real file and lines, numbers, and of course, I checked that today. Well, it changed sometimes, like one line up, one line down, so it's possible that somewhere there, there is a this type. And if you are not used to programming, maybe it would be easier for you to read these Greek letters. And if you look at them in parallel, you will see that, well, that's our lambda calculus, almost lambda calculus. So uh, we have lambdas here and here. Uh, we have these let and case, and it's, it's technically it's syntactic sugar over lambda calculus. We could introduce them for lambda calculus, and it's not a problem there. So, uh, and then there are something different things. And you know, there is only one thing, one constructor for, for, from this data type. We don't, don't have this counterpart here in logic and tick. And it's about profiling. It's about computing time for computation, which it takes. So when you're writing a compiler, you need to think about that, unfortunately. So, so it's not theory. But everything else is, is real theory. And in fact, when we are talking about compiling Haskell code, we actually do it uh, as in this pipeline, and we, after parsing some code, we build so-called abstract syntax tree, and it's very big. There are many constructors, like in Haskell, we have hundreds of them, so different syntax features. And then we type check all that stuff. And the function which I showed you in the very beginning to see fun up, it was about type checking real Haskell code. And there are many cases there. But then we desugar all that stuff into real so-called GHC core. And this core is actually system F omega with a little, with small additions. And then after we have this core, we're just doing real Haskell, without anything else. So it's, so it's just theory. And we work with all those lambdas, and we optimize them. So every optimization is done at this stage here, after the sugaring. So we are actually work with theory, real theory, and not just some Haskell, difficult uh, Haskell stuff. So theory at this stage, theory works. So we are working with theoretical thing. We are working with system F. And there is this quote from a, a paper, Architecture of Open Source Applications. And again, please read it uh, if you have, uh, if, you, if you will. Uh, so it was written by two Simon, Simon Marlow and Simon Peyton Jones, two most prominent uh, guys in Haskell development. So Haskell is about mathematics. So this core stuff is very, very stable. And this paper was written in 2012, and it was stable. After that, for the last six years, core changed many times. <laughs> but from that stuff, it actually it became, it became simpler than at that time. So it is, now it is simpler than six years ago. Because at that time, they had two lambdas. And now we have only one lambda. And we can use that one lambda for types and for values. So, and that's because of the theory. That's because of that foundational mathematics created by Girard there. All right. Uh, so that's it about this nice piece of type theory. And uh, now. I want to advertise myself a little bit. So this is a QR code. So if you scan it, and th there is a link if you don't want to scan it. So it's a giveaway for that book. I will, uh, uh, I will uh, give you an ebook promo code for that book. If you so, it, it, yeah, there is like I have it, it's it's some website for doing this giveaway. So I will choose randomly 
uh, one or two persons. If you, so if you want, please participate. And if you don't want, you can just use this discount for any mining book. So mining publishing, mining publication was so glad to uh, give this, this promo code, discount code for 30% for every mining product. So please, please use it. I think it will work for several days, something like that. Uh, okay, and uh, that's again this, this link to the giveaway. Please follow me on Twitter. I have two Twitters. Please follow both of them. <laughs> yeah, and now I'm ready to answer any questions if you have them. Okay, so. Thanks, Vitaly. Questions? Well, um, just a quick, quick, quick question uh, regarding the um, operational semantics of the uh, untyped lambda calculus. Um, so the question is, um, I guess there is a way to um, make it, um, make evaluation go infinitely. Uh, and I think there is only one way to get it stuck before uh, getting a value. It's uh, to have the x uh, the beginning. Is there any way, uh, other way to get it stuck? I mean, a situation where you, can't, uh, you don't have a value yet, but don't have any uh, rule to apply. Well, of course, it's possible to get stuck. And it's the, the, the um, so uh, it depends. If you're talking about typed or untyped lambda calculus. Untyped. So if it's untyped, then. Uh, uh, well, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking now. Um, so, well, if you have like term like x x with two variables, of course you can do nothing about that. So it's not a value, okay. and it just you just stuck. Yeah. Okay. Here. I see. Thank so you. that's a simple example. And of course it's possible to make uh, to get uh, to have a term with infinite computation, and then like, but if you have type system, it's. Uh, Every term is normalized there, so every term has normal form. And then if you, it's a type term, then it's impossible to get stuck and it's impossible to get infinite computation. And that was, that was the main reason for introducing types. So all terms now are correct. So you can just compute them and you get a result. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yeah, here you go. Um, so you said they were, even back then, they were thinking about adding language features instead of using church numerals, but they didn't have any computers yet, so why did they care about efficiency? Like in the math, you can just say, I just encode things as... Well, you know, uh, originally I was an uh, applied mathematician, yeah. and when you are a mathematician but you want to compute something, then you are even more interested in performance because you are doing that by hand, you know, so so you want to make it easier. <laughs> that makes sense. Thanks, and time for one last question. Yeah, by, by the way, and at, that, at all times, in 19th century, they've come up with so many ideas of how to make more efficient computations. And so, like, if you're, th th there was a paper, I don't remember it, about computing uh, uh, logarithmic tables in uh, Napoleon times. So they, were, they, they have so many tricks there. So it was great uh, thinking about that. So they were so, they liked optimizations very much. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, we have a question there. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, how, how does I.O. maps to this core lambda-related language of Haskell? Uh, what, what first? What, what? I.O. operations, like reading of files, writing to files. Uh, well, uh, I.O. computations are done not during evaluation. 
So uh, I, all computations are executed later. So you have some term which mentions some I.O. computations, but from the uh, point of your runtime system, it's just some points where you call actual I.O. computation. So you may have a lambda term where you, you have some point where you will execute something from I.O. and that's it. So uh, I.O. is a point in, in the, your lambda term, that's it. So just, just some, some, some variable or something, some primitive operation for, uh, from the point of view of uh, lambda calculus. And then when you have a runtime system and you have this lambda term, at that point when you come to this primitive operation, then you execute it. So we don't need to uh, express IO operations here in lambda calculus. You, you don't think? agree, I think? Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> well, maybe we can talk about that later. OK. Thanks, everyone. Uh, if you have any other questions, just catch Vitaly in coffee break. So mm -hmm. thanks, Vitaly. Yeah. Thank you.